G'day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Most people who are interested in aeroplanes have heard of Lawrence Hargrave. Some of those people know that uh, he did his work south of Sydney at a place called Stanwell Park in the 1880s. Less people still will be aware that when the Wright brothers contacted him seeking information, he packaged up everything that he had and he sent it to them. They acknowledged that he was of assistance in their investigations of controlled flight. Then they moved on to controlled powered flight carrying humans. But Lawrence Hargraves was so far back at the beginning of the story that even when you have a look in a relatively old encyclopedia or aviation history tome, you'll get your introduction, your gods and feathered fools and your kites right at the very beginning of the book. Starting in European prehistory, moving quickly through medieval to early industrial, and then Edwardian contraptions. Curiously, 1930s vintage wingsuits are covered under feathered fools in this history, which strangely finishes with Icarus. On the topic of kites, they mention the Chinese, and then uh, they have Colonel Cody, inventor of the British military kite, is over the top of a photographic depiction, captioned Lawrence Hargrave, perfecter of the box kite. That's him standing on the left. In contradistinction to his helper on the right, perfecter of the box kite and greatest of Australia's early pioneers, measuring the lift of a kite with the aid of a, of a spring balance in the 1890s. As I said, we have a Chinese kite with anemometer attached. We have Japanese man lifting kites. To compare with Colonel Cody's kites in the early 1900s. So Cody was 10 years behind Hargrave at least. And there, if I'm not mistaken, is Bill Moyes, who uh, was the first person to fly a Regalo wing ski kite with that A-frame. He didn't invent the A-frame. John Dickinson of Grafton in northern New South Wales invented the A-frame and put it onto the ski kite. But uh, Bill Moyes was the first person to fly one. Buried in the text, we have Lawrence Hargrave, but it was the Australian Lawrence Hargrave who first took kites really seriously. Hargrave made a multitude of kites before perfecting the simple and now familiar box kite in 1893. During... Their early experiments, the Wright brothers knew nothing of Hargrave and made no use of the box kite principles in their flyers. Hargrave's design was incorporated with modifications into a great many early European aeroplanes and gliders, beginning with the Vossen Archdeacon and the Vossen Blériot float gliders of 1905. Okay, that sort of goes a little bit against other sources, because although great aircraft by Norman Macmillan Printed in London by Robert Cunningham and Sons. Could well be the source of that uh, misapprehension because it states on page 27 that from these experiments they, that's the Wright brothers, discovered something no one knew before, that a wing curved from front to rear does not react to the airflow in the same way as a flat plate. Well, as some highly enthusiastic young warbles with a pen has scribbled on the bottom of the page. Yeah, Hargrave knew that in 1885. So let's have a little bit of a look at the aeronautical work of Lawrence Hargrave, this copy of which came from the public school at Stonehenge, which closed down in 1968. So uh, 
This is your one shilling 36 page booklet. Preface. This pamphlet embodies with very slight alterations two articles published in the Technical Gazette of New South Wales. The first dealing with Hargrave's experiments with monoplanes appeared in volume 13, part 2, 1923. The second describing his experiments with curved surfaces and box kites appeared in volume 14, part 1, 1924. Both were published under the title Lawrence Hargrave, Australia's Pioneer in Aviation. Since the date of the publication of these articles, there have been, they have been much sought after, but during recent years, no copies of the gazettes in which they appeared have been available. In order to satisfy this demand, the two articles are combined in the present form. With the display of Hargrave's original monoplane models as a foundation, a splendid opportunity is afforded this museum to illustrate the evolution of the aeroplane from the time when his first model was constructed in 1884 to the present day, and this is being done as fast as circumstances and our financial resources will permit. The aeroplane was not, quote, invented, unquote, by any single experimenter. It gradually evolved as the result of progressive efforts of many dauntless pioneers, some of whom lost their lives in the cause. The, there are already exhibited in the aeronautical section a model of an early Lilienthal glider, 1882, 1892, the Wright brothers' first biplane, 1903, and a Blériot monoplane, 1911. Models of present-day aeroplanes serve to show how the most modern types evolved from these crude beginnings and others now under construction are intended to fill the many gaps which at present exist in the collection. Eventually, these models arranged in sequence will tell a connected story of the very beginnings of the aeroplane and its gradual development into the highly efficient machine of today, 1937. Hargrave's monoplanes will remain for all time a tribute to his resource and ingenuity, but their influence on the achievement of dynamic flight is not to be compared with that of his box kites. Unfortunately, Hargrave's box kites went to Germany. But through the good services of Mr. G. O. Ingledew of Sydney, exact replicas of the most important of these are being constructed from the detailed plans published by Hargrave in the Journal and Proceedings of the Royal Society of New South Wales. These models in their materials, dimensions and weights will correspond identically with Hargrave's originals. They will lack only the sentiment attaching to those constructed by his own hands. Some are already exhibited and in a few months it is anticipated that all the most important will be on view. Under construction at the present time also is a Santos Dumont biplane, 1906, the first aeroplane to fly publicly. And this machine will show very clearly the importance of the Hargrave box kite and the influence it had in aeronautical evolution, for it was essentially an arrangement of Hargrave kites placed side by side. When flying against the wind, it was found that an aeroplane of this design was quite stable, but its stability was seriously affected in the side wind owing to the presence of the vertical surfaces. Improvement was effected by the removal of some of these and eventually the whole of them were eliminated, leaving the upper and lower planes in essentially the same form as we see them today. The box kite form of tail, however, persisted for a considerable time afterwards. Models of these machines will serve to illustrate this development very clearly. The Wright brothers' biplane followed a somewhat different line of evolution and although these pioneers acknowledged their indebtedness to Hargrave, his direct influence in the development of their aeroplane is less apparent. The Wright biplane can, however, be clearly traced back to the gliders of Lilienthal, the great German pioneer of gliding flight, who, beginning his experiments with monoplanes, later constructed biplane gliders, and it was the failure of one of these which caused his death in 1896. Lilienthal's work was taken up by Pilcher in England and Chanute in America, the former concentrating on monoplane and the latter on biplane gliders, and then the Wright brothers entered the field at a time when the internal combustion engine had attained a degree of efficiency which adapted it to use in an aeroplane. The first aeroplane to fly was therefore a biplane glider fitted with an internal combustion engine. The aeronautical exhibits of this museum are being planned to tell this story with the aid of accurate scale models, and in doing this we feel that we are paying, out a, paying but a small tribute to the wonderful pioneering efforts of Lawrence Hargrave, who to some extent at least made the telling of the story possible. Lawrence Hargrave was born in England in 1850. He was the son of John Fletcher Hargrave, who practised at the Equity Bar in London until 1856 when he came to Australia. He was soon afterward made a New South Wales District Court judge and in 1865 a judge of the Supreme Court. 
Lawrence remained in England to continue his education and came to Australia in 1866 at the age of 16. He was first apprenticed to an engineering firm and later an assistant at the Sydney Observatory. During his work at the observatory, his attention was directed to the study of air currents. This led him to ponder over the problem of flight and fired him with an ambition to solve the problem of human flight. He decided to make his life's, this he decided to make his life's work. From 1884 to 1892, he experimented with monoplane models constructed of a framework of light wood and tissue paper. And from 1892 till 1909, when his last paper on aeronautics appeared, he concentrated his attention on box kites and curved surfaces. Toward the end of his life, Hargrave took up a study of early Australian exploration and made some public deductions from personal observation that failed to secure approval from more experienced historians. He died at Sydney on 6 July 1915 at the age of 65, but he had lived to receive the thanks and the admiration of the greatest aviation pioneers. So says T.C. Roughly, July 10, 1933, on page 4. Part 1, Experiments with Monoplanes Introduction. The majority of Australians have probably never heard of Lawrence Hargrave. Of those who have, many possess but a vague idea of the man and his work. There are some who will say that he invented the aeroplane, others that he was a crank obsessed with the idea that he had solved the problem of flight. While there are others, again, who endeavour to discount his work entirely. Few, indeed, are possessed of an accurate knowledge of Hargrave's real position in the history of aviation. It may be stated at once that Hargrave did not invent the aeroplane. He was not a crank but he probably did as much to bring about the accomplishment of dynamic flight as any other single individual. He did the pioneer work. The aeroplane evolved from the accumulated efforts of many dauntless workers. No single individual can be said to have invented it. The Wright brothers in America were the first to fly, but the machine in which they flew embodied the ideas of many workers before them. It was the work of such men as Hargrave, Lilienthal, Pilcher, Chanute and others which made this flight possible. The following sketch is intended to convey a brief account of Hargrave's experiments from their inception in 1884 till 1909, when his last published work on aviation appeared. The whole of the information is taken from the Proceedings of the Royal Society of New South Wales, to which Hargrave communicated his discoveries freely and openly as soon as they were made. Had he patented the whole of his inventions, there is little doubt that he would have benefited very materially but this he ever refused to do, in spite of the continued exhortations of his friends. He was possessed of sufficient means to keep him in such comfort as he desired, and the love of his work was more to him and brought him greater real enjoyment than all the wealth in the world. Hargrave's attitude of mind is expressed in a statement he made in 1890. Quote, the writer thinks that the act of invention to be a sort of inspiration and a pleasure that the individual does not seek to be rewarded for undergoing. It is followed by a greedy sensation or wish to obtain money from others without giving an equivalent. Inventors will always invent. They cannot help it and you cannot stop them. And a patentee is nothing but a legal robber. Unquote. Hargrave published to the world his discoveries Others often seized and patented them. Perhaps this was the cause of his last remark. He was afraid a patent would restrict the use of aviation, whereas he wanted every worker in the field of aviation to use his ideas freely and, if possible, to improve on them. Thus and thus only would the most rapid strides be made toward the common goal. Hargrave cared little who was the fortunate one to actually fly first, so long as it was accomplished. The objective of his life's work was first to discover the secret of dynamic flight and second to freely assist others in its achievement. The progress of civilization demanded aerial transport. The individual did not matter. The crossbar is free to rotate on the central axle. The model is out on that side to be tested. And we have a mass balance on the other end. Captioned, oar-shaped wings driven by clockwork, 1884. Theory of flapping wings. The first paper read by Hargrave before the Royal Society of New South Wales was entitled, quote, The Trochoided Plane, unquote. This was a theoretical discussion of the movement of animals such as worms, slugs, jellyfish, and fishes. 
and the motion of ocean waves and led naturally to the study of the flight of birds. Even at this time, Hargrave appears to have anticipated the successful results of his experiments, for he stated that, quote, the trochoidal action of fins, muscles, and legs seemed so plain that I could not help but being led to theorize on the action of wings in flight. I say theorize simply because I have not a flying machine to show you, but the chain of evidence seems so complete and I have no doubt it will be soon it will soon be accomplished without the aid of a, of the screw or gas bag. The flapping motion of the wings of birds formed the basis of the means of propulsion in all of Hargrave's earlier work. And although at this meeting of the society no actual flying machine was shown, there were exhibited several models which incorporated this idea. Chief of these was a pair of oar-shaped wings suspended from a horizontal rod rotating round a vertical support figure one. A musical box spring was used as motive power to flap the wings. It was found that 93 revolutions around the vertical axis were made in eight minutes, and when the inertia had been overcome, the machine was doing its best. Seven and a half flaps of the wings were sufficient to complete the circle. An early flapping wing model, probably 1885, with the wings in two sections, a vertical fin and fixed tail planes. The motive power was rubber bands in tension. Having demonstrated that the mechanical action of flapping wings was capable of readily propelling a body through the air, Hargrave began the construction of models of flying machines in an endeavor to discover the secret of sustaining surfaces requisite to maintaining equilibrium in flight. The earliest monoplanes. Between August 1884 and June 1885, when Hargrave's second paper entitled, quote, Notes on Flying Machines, unquote, was read before the Royal Society, he experimented with nearly 50 models, with such success that he stated, quote, experimenting with nearly 50 models has resulted in these that I hope to show you supporting themselves and moving horizontally in such a way that if the motion is not that used by birds, it is at all events very like it, unquote. Several of these models are shown in figure three. Clockwork, which had previously provided the motive power, was now discarded in favour of rubber bands, which in proportion to their weight were found to transmit more power. I think store would be a better word than transmit there. In this paper, also Hargrave incorporated diagrams demonstrating how air compressed into spherical or spindle-shaped steel vessels could be made to drive a direct-acting single-cylinder oscillating engine for the purpose of flapping the wings. He persevere, persevered with rubber bands, however, for some considerable time afterwards. Rubber bands as motive power. The general arrangement of the parts of a typical rubber band-driven model with which Hargrave was experimenting at this time may be seen in figure four. This model was exhibited on the 2nd of December, 1885. It had a wing spread of seven feet, two inches. The length of the body and head was six feet, one and a half inches. The total weight, by the way, that's figure four, captioned a flapping wing model using rubber bands as motive power, 1885. Figure three, collection of Hargrave's earliest models. Which you could well call variations on the theme. So the weight was 1.47 pounds and it had an area of 840 square inches per pound of weight. The strut formed the backbone of the model. It was about one and a quarter inches square, made of clear pine, and was hollowed out to about the thickness of cardboard. It tapered slightly towards the tail. The 24 elastic bands weighed five ounces, and each was stretched with a force of 12.6 pound to 30 and 5 eighths inches. The distance this machine flew was 120 feet. It was stopped by a fence on the top of which it caught eight feet below the starting point. The trajectory was slightly ascending at first, but very little. The wings flapped 10 times in seven seconds, which gave a horizontal speed of 14.6 miles per hour or 15 feet per stroke. 
The center of gravity of the machine when wound up and the rubber band stretched to their utmost was two feet five inches. That'll be from the leading edge. The center of gravity after eight strokes was two feet two inches. The mean center of effort, two feet nine inches, all measured from the forward end of the strut. At about this time, also, a similarly constructed machine flew 170 feet. Reference to the figure will show that no provision was made for steering this model. This aspect was not overlooked by Hargrove, for he stated, quote, The steering of flying machines on this principle requires a rapidity of thought and action that will at first tax the nerves to the utmost. But in one-man machines, practice will reduce the movements of the body necessary to alter the centre of gravity to the various requirements to as simple an act of volition as skating or riding a bicycle. John Dickinson and Bill Moyes, eat your hearts out. In larger machines, this will have to be done by making the area of the tail variable for ascending or descending and tilting one corner up or down for turning to either side, unquote. Apparently, this type of machine flew with an undulating motion for Hargrave remarks, quote, It has occurred to me that the motion of this form of flying machine will produce seasickness. Time will show if this is correct, unquote. Unsuccessful man carrying machine. In June 1887, Hargrave produced plans of and constructed a full size machine on wheels in order to ascertain, amongst other things, the weight of a machine sufficiently strong to bear a man's weight and transmit his power and the most convenient form and arrangement necessary for this purpose. Propulsion was to be obtained by means of flapping wings operated by a handle turned by the hands. Naturally, little success attended this experiment, but it served to demonstrate to Hargrave that the requisite power was unattainable by manual effort. Improvements to monoplanes. Meanwhile, Hargrave, with unabated zeal, continued to experiment with his models, which he gradually improved in order to obtain longer flights while still using rubber bands as the motive power. The improvements were effected in five main particulars. One, the triangular plane placed at the head of all the earlier models on the main strut anterior to the flapping wings was discarded. Two, the centres of gravity and effort were both brought further forward, resulting in a much easier and more graceful motion. Three, the mid-rib of the wings, which in earlier models had been placed in various positions ranging from the middle of the wing to a distance approximately one-third from the leading edge, was now placed at the forward edge of the wing, bringing the torsional stress of the rib into play and effecting a very marked improvement. Four, the wings were made longer and narrower with the outside edge square. This was found to offer more resistance produced more thrust and flapped more slowly. Five, the rubber bands were in, increased to 48. Such a model, this is titled rubber band flapping model, flapping wing model flown in 1887. Such a model employing, embodying these improvements may be seen in figure five. That's the one there. This was exhibited on the 7th of December, 1887 and the following details of its construction and performance may be found interesting. Total weight of the model, 33 and a half ounces. Weight of 48 vulcanized India rubber bands, 10 ounces. Area of the body plane, 13.3 square feet. Area of the wings, 1.5 square feet. Extreme length of model, five feet, seven inches. Spread of wings, six feet, one inch. Each wing flapped in an arc of 107 degrees and 20 minutes. There were 470 foot-pounds of energy stored in the model when the bands were stretched to the tail by winding the cord on the winder. This model flew 270 feet horizontally in a dead calm. Experiments with motors. The years 1888 and 1889 saw more marked improvements in Hargraves models than during any period there hitherto. Particular attention was paid to the motive power. In this connection, Hargrave states, Great efforts have been made to get a reliable motor. A single cylinder vertical engine absorbed much time and labour, but want of skill in construction involved such an amount of unnecessary weight that if it is ever completed, it will nearly all have to be remade. Unquote. The centering difficulty gave birth to several curious mechanisms for pulling the crank off the centre. This was ingeniously and successfully overcome. Petroleum spirit was next tried as a motive power, 
and Hargrave in the following words describes with evident good humour his efforts to construct a suitable engine. Quote, the next engine constructed had a variety of tackle or using petroleum spirit vapour as a motive power, the only result as yet being that manual skill in silver soldering and light engine work was acquired, unquote. At this time, Hargrave discovered a simple mechanical movement by which a wing can be made to describe rigidly the figure of eight observable in the motions of the wings of living organisms. Screw propelled monoplanes. Attention was then directed to the propulsion of aeroplane models by means of a screw. Three varieties of models were made, mainly with double, single, and single screws in the bow and a single screw in the stern. The last mentioned, Hargrave says, proved to be the most practicable and serviceable form. For purposes of comparison, two models were made with similar construction, both driven by rubber bands, one fitted with a revolving screw and the other actuated by flapping wings. Careful calculations were made of the relative weights, area, power and distance flown, with the result that as propellers, the screw and the flapping wings were found to be about equally efficient. See that little asterisky there? That leads us down to here. This comparison between a screw and a flapping wing cannot be taken to apply generally to their respective merits, for the design of screw, as used by Hargrave, was hopelessly inefficient. The extremities of his screws were always made the largest part in order that the greatest disturbance of air might be affected, for here the speed is greatest. In modern efficient screws, each blade is made to do as much work as possible, for it is desirable that the stream of air which is thrown backwards should be moving with uniform speed in order to avoid turbulence. To meet these conditions, the screw is made of truly helical formation. That is to say, the angle of the blade with the plane of rotation is made least at the tip and gradually increases to a maximum at the center or boss. Such a screw grips the air and its progression is to some extent similar to that of a nut or bolt. So effectively, Hargrave had the world's worst aerial propellers but he didn't know that so therefore he thought that propellers and flapping wings were about equally efficient and they are if you have a horrible propeller three cylinder compressed air engine next a three cylinder trunk engine was made to be driven by compressed air this was found to work very smoothly and carried 120 pounds of air pressure it combined lightness with accessibility and simplicity of construction and adjustment in, in an eminent degree. The weight was but 19 and a half ounces. This engine was made in about 120 hours at a cost for material of 12 shillings, dollar 20. Invention of a rotary aeroplane engine. Having successfully constructed this engine, Hargrave at once set about improving on it with the result that he conceived the idea of arranging the cylinders on the blades of the propeller. Such an engine with rotating cylinders has since come to be generally referred to as a rotary aeroplane engine. This was one of the greatest inventions of Hargrave's career and in itself was sufficient to have stamped him as an engineer of exceptional resource and ingenuity. To quote Hargrave's own words, quote, the idea was conceived that a three-cylinder screw engine could be made by turning the boss of the propeller into an engine, thus allowing the cylinders to revolve on the crankshaft, the shaft and crank pin being stationary, and the thrust coming direct on the valve face. Of course, the idea was put into execution with all speed. The resulting engine weighed three quarters of a pound and was found to work so satisfactorily that further experiments were conducted with it. These resulted in the production of an engine weighing only seven and a half ounces, with revolutions at the rate of 456 per minute, the receiver pressure falling from 150 pound to about 120 pounds. Captioned, Rotary Aeroplane Engine Invented by Hargrave in 1889. 1889. The cylinders were 0.88 inches diameter and the stroke was 1.3 inches and the valve cut off at 0.75 of the stroke. 
The screw blades were set at an angle of 20 degrees, the diameter of the screw was 36 and one quarter inches, and the area of each blade was 32.7 square inches. The engine is illustrated in figure six, which is reproduced from the photograph taken of Hargrave's original model in 1889. It is worthy of note that several of the most successful early aeroplane engines were constructed on this principle, probably best known being the celebrated French Gnome. Yet how many people are aware that this was invented in Sydney by Lawrence Hargrave? There we see a Lerone rotary, 110 horsepower, nine cylinder. Lerone was a 9J, this is a Clerget 9B rotary, 130 horsepower. As fitted, either one or both to a sop with camel of great fame. Just saying, planes placed at a dihedral angle. With the adoption of the screw in place of the flapping wings, Hargrave set the two halves of the body plane at a dihedral angle. Greater stability was thereby attained by lowering the centre of gravity and providing for greater lateral resistance to the atmosphere. Centre of gravity. Much experimenting was done to ascertain the best position of the centre of gravity to ensure the greatest stability. In the three most successful machines made up to this time, 1889, the percentages of the area in advance of the centres of gravity were 19.3%, 20% and 23.3% respectively. Hargrave remarks that, quote, these positions were arrived at by experience gained by repeated wrecks when groping in comparative darkness, unquote. Between August 1889 and June 1890, Hargrave's time was devoted principally to the simplification of the design of the engine and calculating its efficiency. He was convinced that no elaborate contrivances were required to make an aeroplane fly, and rather humorously remarks about the efforts of previous experimenters. Quote, it is thought that much useful work has been lost to us by experimenters loading their apparatus with devices to save them from damage and artistic conceits to show where passengers are to be seated in ornamental cars with flags, etc. It should be remembered that flying machines are only to battle with the air and not for knocking down fences or ploughing up the ground. It is not usual to proportion the scantling and plating of ships so that they will stand beating on rocks and sand but only to resist the strains produced by the winds and waves. Perhaps much of the writer's success has been due to the avoidance of this fault, although it is somewhat of a trial to see a month's work knocked the all out of shape in a moment." Unquote. The one additional part allowed was a stick projecting about 16 inches before the engine, so that when the machine came to earth, the stick was broken and the engine and the cylinder containing the compressed air were less injured than they would otherwise have been. Figure 7, flapping wing model driven by compressed air. This machine flew 368 feet on the 18th of April, 1890. Flapping wings driven by compressed air. Having decided that about an equal degree of efficiency was obtained by the screw and the flapping wings, Hargrave continued his experiments with both. The improvements which have just been described are embodied in the model illustrated in figure seven. The features to be noted in this model are one, the dihedral angle of the two halves of the plane, two, the long cylinder containing compressed air for driving the single cylinder engine, three, the flapping wings, four, the length of the body, and five, the projecting stick to break the fall. This model weighed 2.53 pounds and covered a total area including the wings of 16.28 square feet it flew 368 feet on the 8th of April, 1890. Shorter bodies tested. Hargrave now experimented with the object of discovering whether the long bodies which had characterized his models up to this time were really necessary and whether equal if not greater efficiency could not be obtained by shortening them considerably. The model illustrated in figure seven was the actual one to be first experimented with. Hargrave states that this machine appeared to be perfectly balanced on its seventh trial and yet, when the two intermediate segments on each side were removed, the model was still in equilibrium, although 41.8% of the area was in advance of the centre of gravity. The explanation given by Hargrave was, quote, It seemed as if the centre of part of the body is best removed, 
as it only serves to conduct the air, the inertia of which has been overcome by the weight of the forward part of the machine to the tail. Whereas if the middle of the body plane has been cut out, the air, the used air escapes upwards and the tail has a better chance of get, getting comparatively solid air to float on, unquote. Single cylinder compressed air flapping wing model 1890. Heavier monoplane model. In spite of these results, Hargrave continued to build his models with long bodies for some time afterwards, and on the 3rd of December 1890, communicated to the Royal Society the results he obtained with a larger and heavier model built on the same lines as the one just described. There were, however, one or two slight modifications. This machine is illustrated in figure eight, and the similarity to the previous model is at once apparent. The greatest difference was in the weight. While this latest machine weighed 4.63 pounds, the previous one weighed only 2.53 pounds. The wings were exactly the same area and length as those of the lighter model, but they were made of oak with five ash crossbars instead of four. Also, in the heavier machine, there was attached to the side of the air cylinder a 60 tooth clock wheel with two ratchets, one of which was pulled up and down by a string fastened to the wing arm. This wheel registered the number of flaps the wings made in the course of the flight. It is clearly shown in the photograph of the front of this machine reproduced in figure nine. The sides of the body plane sloped upwards at an angle of 18 degrees and the paper area was slightly less per pound weight than in the 2.53 pound machine. Fearing that some objection might be raised to the increased area of the planes, Hargrave with a levity which he occasionally allowed to brighten the technicalities of his papers marked, quote, the large area might be considered a defect but when we consider that it consists only of a few sticks and tissue paper, and that the atmosphere is not by any means crowded with flying machines, the objection ceases to have much weight. Figure 9. Enlarged view of the front of the model illustrated in Figure 7, showing the details of the engine. Pretty good for 1890. Flights of 305 and 343 feet. Altogether, six flights were made with this model and the apparent trajectories of the fifth and sixth, which measured 305 feet and 343 feet respectively, are shown in figure 10. Figure 10, apparent course taken by the machine illustrated in figure eight in its two most successful flights, which measured 305 and 343 feet respectively. These flights are best described by Hargrave, are described by Hargraves in the following words, quote, The machine in trial five turned up and almost stopped, but resumed its course when the preponderance of the forward part brought it horizontal again. A lump of lead was put on the end of the braking stick for trial six. This is clearly shown in figure eight. The lead shifted the center of gravity one inch further forward and produced the undulatory flight that is shown in the drawing. Each observation adds fresh weight to the assumption that the true position of the centre of gravity for a continuous rectangular surface is situated between 0.25 and 0.2 of the length from the forward end. After trial six, the machine was attached to the chronograph to see what the receiver pressure was at the 38th double vibration, the number registered by the counter. But after making three or four flaps at the rate of 200 per minute, all the paper was dashed out of the wings and the port link lugs were dragged out of the cylinder cover. But again, knowledge is gained for the future. We learn that the chronographic test of the wing speed of the stationary machine is no guide to the speed of the flying machine. As the rapidly flapping wing creates a vacuum behind it of sufficiently low pressure to allow the return stroke of the wing to pass so quickly through it that the shock of the wing against the air at the other side of the vacuum is strong enough to destroy the paper. The efficiency of the wings during the free flight is not impaired by this cause, as every stroke is taken in new and solid air, and the wing speed is obviously not in excess of 120 per minute. So, 
he's discovered the difference between static thrust and dynamic thrust and a helicopterologist would say that he's figured out why rotor decay happens. Now with this table we have a list of the various machines uh, 24 band ABC, 48 band FGH, 24 band HJK, 48 band L, 48 band screw, 40.5 ounce compressed air, 74 ounce compressed air. And along here we have the total area in square inches, the square inches area per pound weight, the weight in pounds, the power and foot pounds, the distance flown in feet. So 24 band model A, 1,236 square inches, uh, 841 square inches per pound of weight. Weight of 1.47 pounds, uh, power and foot pounds, 164. Distance flown 120 feet, uh, 368 feet is the highest, 343 is the next runner up. 120, 170, 201, 189, 171, 192, 203, 209, 270. 120, 368 and 343. So what we've got is the 40.5 ounce compressed air, total area 2,344 square inches, square inches of area per pound of weight, that's the wing loading, 925 square inches per pound, 2.53 pounds, 870 foot pounds, 368 feet, uh, foot flight. So that 2.53 pounds versus 4.63 uh, pounds, right? Um, and we've got 870 pounds versus 789. So it's got more power, more power, it's got less weight. Unsurprisingly, it goes further. As they say, simplicate and add more lightness. Figure 11, compressed air bow screw machine driven by a three-cylinder stationary engine. So he's invented the radial aircraft engine as well as the rotary. Here we have a really good view of it. Three-cylinder screw machine. The number 13 machine is illustrated in figure 11. The air was compressed into a cylinder called by Hargrave the receiver. 2 inches in diameter and 4 feet 7 inches long. The planes were broader than long, 5 foot 7 and a half inches wide and 3 feet 9 and a half inches long and were set at a dihedral angle. Of the total area, 22.3% was in advance of the centre of gravity. A three-cylinder stationary engine, figure 12, that's what you're looking at, was placed astride the forward end of the receiver driving a two-bladed screw at the bow of the machine. The whole apparatus weighed 46.86 ounces when it was charged with air at a pressure of 230 pounds per square inch. He was pretty good at making air tanks out of brass shim, wasn't he? For the purpose of counting the number of revolutions made by the propeller in flight, a reel of cotton was placed on an axis parallel to the screw shaft and an empty reel was secured on the crankshaft. The turns of cotton that were wound onto the latter reel were counted after the flight. These corresponded with the total revolutions. The screw or propeller was right-handed and was 31.6 inches in length from tip to tip. Each blade was five inches wide at the outer edge and three inches at the inner edge and was nine inches long. The machine flew 128 feet with a fall of three, inch, three feet 10 inches, while the duration of the flight was eight seconds. The speed was therefore 10.34 miles per hour the engine made 49 revolutions with a reduced pressure of 45 pounds per square inch. When the propeller revolved, it was found that a listing moment or torque. Here we have the asterisk again. Whoops. We'll come down here and read this. This listing moment or torque has to be taken into account in the construction of modern aeroplanes, particularly in small high powered machines. The torque has the effect of making the aeroplane fly with one wing down unless means are taken to prevent it happening. 
The tendency can be counteracted by a very slight aileron mov movement, but in most aeroplanes, the angle of incidence of one wing is increased and of the other decreased, just at the tips, in order to give an unequal lift on the two tips. The same result may be obtained by erecting the aeroplane so that when the aileron control appears central to the pilot, there is in reality a slight effect just sufficient to balance the torque. The Wright Brothers machine was fitted with two screws revolving in opposite directions. The effect of the torque was, in consequence, completely absent. Okay, going back to the asterisk. A listing moment or torque was produced, which an ounce of lead placed at the edge of the right-hand plane, 32.25 inches to the right of the centre of gravity, was found insufficient to counteract. This list, although slight, nevertheless turned the machine to port and consequently it flew in a curved course. Larger flapping wing model. The number 14 machine was larger than the number 13. It was a flapping wing model driven by a single cylinder vibrating engine. The air receiver was 2 inches in diameter and 6 feet 11 inches in length. The working pressure was 250 pounds to the square inch while 22.27% of the total area was in advance of the centre of gravity. A clock wheel similar to that shown in the model illustrated in figure 8 registered the number of vibrations. The total weight of the machine when charged with air was 59 ounces. This model flew 312 feet in 19 seconds making 46 double vibrations at 57 pound per square inch reduced pressure. The flight was above the level of the eye until the engine stopped for some unexplained cause. It fell to the ground almost vertically and not the slightest damage was done for the machine worked perfectly when removed to the workshop. The wings made 90 double variations before the pressure fell to 50 pounds. From this, Hargrave calculated that 600 feet was not too much to expect it to fly. Reply to skeptics. It is apparent at this time that there have been many who were doubtful whether any practical result could accrue from Hargrave's experiments. To such sceptics, Hargrave addressed, addressed himself as follows, quote, It may be said that it is a waste of time to make machines of such small capabilities and that no practical good can come of them, but we must not try too much at first. We must remember that all our inventions are but mere developments of crude ideas, that a commercially successful result in a practically unexplored field cannot possibly be got up without an enormous amount of unremunerative work. It is the piled up and recorded experience of many busy brains that produces the luxurious travelling conveniences of today that in no way astonish us. And there is no reason for supposing that we shall always be content to keep on the agitated surface of the sea and air when it is possible to travel in a superior or inferior plane unimpeded by frictional disturbances. It does not follow that because the machine described in these pages are of small weight and large area, the insignificant performances of much larger ones of similar proportions are to be scouted. For instance, 400 pound weight of tin tubing silk and steel wire would serve to carry one man 500 yards at 17 miles per hour. And indeed, in 1976, when uh, Air Navigation Order 95.10 was gazetted in August in Australia, a minimum aircraft was designed to be limited to a 400 pound takeoff weight. He wasn't far wrong. Even the early ultralights flew a little bit faster than 17 and a half miles per hour, but he got the takeoff weight spot on. And such a result, though of no commercial utility, would mark an epoch in the art at least as hopeful as the earliest attempts at marine steam propulsion. Unquote. The 16th monoplane. During 1892, another compressed air-driven machine, number 16, was constructed. In this model, the planes were slightly longer than broad, while the engine was a single-cylinder vibrating type which drove flapping wings. Twelve trials were made with this machine, and only one proved successful. On this occasion, it flew 343 feet in 23 seconds, with 54 and a half double vibrations of the engine. It had 25.1% of the area in advance of the centre of gravity, and in flight, ascended slightly, possibly 10 degrees. Tandem planes were fitted to the number 16 model during one of the experiments. The dimensions of the forward plane were 52 inches by 18 inches, and of the after one, 64 inches by 18 inches, leaving a distance of 5 feet between them. 
Hargrave stated that this form proved to be very stable, but no records of its flight are given. First steam motor. During the same year, Hargrave set out to make a steam motor lighter than the compressed air apparatus with a uniform boiler pressure and capable of flapping the wings of standard size as fast as the compressed air engine did and for a longer time. This he succeeded in doing using methylated spirit as fuel. The engine was fitted to a model similar to the number 12 machine and the whole structure only weighed 64 and a half ounces, which included 12 and three quarter ounces for the strut and body plane and five ounces for spirit and water. The motor therefore weighed three and a quarter pounds. It was found that 0.169 of a horsepower was developed when 2.35 double variations were made per double vibrations were made per second. Okay, two and a third flaps to the second, 0.16 of a horsepower. A seventh of a horsepower? During the same year, Hargrave, it's about 100 watts, Hargrave set out to make a steam motor lighter than the compressed air apparatus. Yeah, done that. There is no record that this machine actually flew, but Hargrave calculated that if it were loaded with 10 ounces more spirit and water to bring it to the same weight as the number 12 machine, which flew 343 feet with 38 double vibrations, the steam propelled model was capable of attaining 546 double vibrations, which would give a possible range of 1,640 yards, just shy of a mile, which is 1,760. Having successfully constructed this engine and having three cylinders, another having three cylinders was designed to rotate two wings through 360 degrees of arc in exactly the same time without the interposition of bevel gearing. The cylinders were attached to one wing and the crank to the other, the cylinders being free to rotate in the opposite direction to the crank pin. This engine was estimated to develop at least one horsepower and to weigh two and a half pounds, but though complete plans were prepared, it was never actually built. Second steam motor. During 1893, Hargrave constructed his second steam motor for use on flying machine models. Its total weight without spirit, water or body plane was 5 pounds 11 ounces. This weight, however, included 6 feet 9 inches of 1.5 by quarter inch redwood, which formed the strut for the body plane. During portion of the time this motor was running, it was working at a speed of 171 double vibrations per minute. On the assumption that this speed could be relied on for a few minutes, Hargrave calculated that although the weight of the motor was twice that of the previous one driven by steam, the power was increased fourfold. Last motor experiments. At this time also, three two-bladed screw motors were made, but these were only partially successful, and further experiments on motors were abandoned in order that more attention might be devoted to the better disposition of the supporting surfaces of aeroplanes. Hargrave now began his investigation into the behaviour of curved surfaces in the wind, the outcome of which was the development of various types of kites, which will be described in the following section. And we're approaching the hour mark, sort of more or less, so I'm going to have a cup of coffee, and I will return for a part two. And we'll go into all of this sort of stuff in more detail. of which this is but a teaser, a taster. Box kite with reverse curves, 1909. Part two will be another movie. Right now, it's news time, as well as coffee time. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. More than $48 billion has been wiped off the Australians. We've had this kind of situation playing out for a number of weeks where people have just been ploughing into stocks and picking up stocks, whatever their quality and characteristic. It's a broad-based dumping.
Oh, I was only saying nine. Chill. Coroner James McDougall has today delivered his report after a lengthy inquest. He found Dreamworld was aware of the...